Okay, so everything works, which is really good. Uh, uh, it was a long drive to uh, come here from Urbana-Champagne, but the weather was gorgeous. And actually, one thing that I really enjoy driving um, around here is that the sky is so beautiful that uh, you really kind of uh, cannot find a better place than uh, what we have in, in the Midwest in terms of the, the sky and how the clouds form. And you will see that it will be actually part of my presentation that's uh, I felt I want to call my wife and then share that experience with her, but I couldn't. And I couldn't really convey the 3D uh, feeling that you have when you look at the skies and then you see the clouds. So today I'm going to talk about real-time 3D cloning because that's what I wanted to do in the car. And there is a, there is a name for that, teleimmersive space. Let me introduce first what I mean by teleimmersive space and then show you how we are building this uh, space, how large of a collaboration it is and then some challenges and some solutions that we have, and maybe discuss with you what we could do next, because uh, as I was coming here, I realized that I have been doing uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research for about seven years, and I always start with terminology. Because when you say attribute and I see feature, do we really mean the same? So in this case, I start with very simple set of slides. Okay, why is communication important? And there are several slides before me that kind of uh, show that Communication is important for education, social interaction, business, military command, and control. <coughs> and really our goal when we communicate is to convey information and then interact. So how do, we, how do we do that? How do we better convey information? Well, as we have set of geographical locations, I might be in Urbana-Champaign, you might be here in, in St. Louis, and somebody can be in DC. We want to present dynamically changing information in time and 3D space, and we really want to expose all our senses. Uh, so um, what would you do? Well, if you look at the history, you can go back and see the smoke signals. Were already, you know, they already indicated the, the internet coming, the www. Or maybe you can go to postal pigeons and use them to deliver your messages. And there are multiple ways how you can do it. With the current technology, you can look at email, text messaging, teleconferencing. And you can see that I put there some pictures showing satellites and cell phones, which is probably the most uh, frequent way how we communicate when we are at different remote uh, geographical locations. So what would be the best way for you today to communicate with me? I'm in Urbana-Champaign, you are here. How would we get together and communicate? The most fancy way how we could communicate is that at NCSA we have this access grid, which is really a set of 2D video screens. You can put it on your on your uh, uh, wall anywhere, and then you see me in one video stream, in another video stream you see yourself, and maybe some other participants, as you see, uh, we ran uh, several sessions uh, across the country with Taiwan and so forth. And the other way how we could communicate is that we say, well, why don't we go to a virtual reality environment? And as you know, in Illinois we have the cave and cube environment where you walk in, it's a CAD model, here you can see the uh, the town, and then you suddenly start to walk there, they give you a head-mounted device, and uh, as you turn, uh, everything is going to change. And uh, maybe if you are really uh, uh, interested in science, what you do in the right uh, uh, lower corner, uh, you can walk in and interact with, let's say, DNA structures, right? That's the way how to learn. But in reality, what I really would like to do, I would like to clone you at this moment, put you into a virtual space, clone all the people in Urbana-Champagne, put them into the same virtual space, and then start to interact. That's what I would like to do. So really what I want to do is I want to really do a union of the network virtual reality and the video streams, and clearly there are significant com computing and image mining tasks, and then more or less as I'm cloning the real world and making it available in the virtual reality environment, we can start to interact. We can start to, we can really interact in 3D and more or less the geographical locations that are very, uh, very distant can more or less uh, disappear. Okay, uh, why would we want to do the 3D teleimmersive spaces? Because the video conferencing is good when we deal with 2D uh, interaction. But as soon as I want to teach you how to play basketball, and I have the basketball hoop here, and I have a ball, and I want to show you that the ball has to go through the hoop, I really need something that conveys the 3D information. And in virtual reality, I can do it, but first I have to build my CAD model, I have to build the whole environment, and then I can take you to the cave and then show you 
uh, how, to do, how to put the ball through the hoop. But in the teleimmersive space, if I could do it in real time, right, that really justifies why we uh, uh, might need teleimmersive space. Also, there might be some objects that would be synthetic and some objects uh, that might be uh, coming from your physical space. And this teleimmersive space would allow you to bring these uh, uh, objects from a physical space uh, together with the objects that are living in a virtual world. Like, uh, like uh, um, if you know, uh, uh, like uh, my face or some of these uh, uh, gaming uh, uh, environments. Okay, so we set the goal to design a portable, reconfigurable and inexpensive teleimmersion uh, system to provide real time 3D reconstruction and fusion of multiple dynamically changing, geographically distributed environments for interactive collaborations. So how did we go about it? So, uh, you know, I uh, kind of believe that you really have to bring a lot of smart people together in order to solve a big problem like this one. So what we did, uh, we actually built a team uh, which consists of uh, NCSA researchers, uh, people from our campus and from the UC Berkeley. And uh, we started to talk about the requirements of such a system. So, Clearly, the first requirement is what I really want to do, I want to get X, Y, Z, and uh, temperature or a time uh, and a spectral information uh, at every time uh, stamp. And then the more or less know about the interaction of these clone objects with the, with the virtual object, and then kind of give the feedback to the people who are in this virtual space. And again, we came up with several approaches like stereo vision, type of light ranging, multi-spectral imaging, different analyses of the scene measurements and so forth. How could I make it portable? If you tell me, bring it, Peter, tomorrow here and we will have a session with Urbana Champagne, how could I do it? Well, clearly I'm gonna be building a reconfigurable hardware. Uh, I have to figure out how to easily set up the whole system. And uh, so we were doing, we kind of mounted all our hardware on tripods, cards, so we can just move it around and set it up anywhere. How do I achieve the inexpensive part? If you go to HP, uh, they can sell you probably something for half a mil and more, and it's only gonna cover your face. There are many companies currently that work on uh, video conferencing, but just covering your head. We really wanted to have the entire body when we interact. So our goal was less than 50K. We figured out many baby boomers are gonna retire soon. Uh, maybe that's our market. Uh, these people will be willing to pay $50,000 and instead of going to a hospital for a session, they will have a session with a nurse at home and they can exercise and then the nurse is gonna tell them how to exercise. So why don't we look at some commercial off-the-shelf components, open source software. We know that the web 2.0 is coming so we will have high bandwidth. Let's uh, try to go for it. What about robustness? Okay, so let's suppose I would set up the environment right here and as you can see, I step up and there is a shadow that's gonna change. So depending on the illumination, the shadow is gonna move. Should I reconstruct that shadow as part of the virtual space? Uh, what if uh, somebody turns off the lights and then things are changing? So how, how sensitive is the environment to uh, your particular setup, uh, your illumination and uh, other variables? Is it scalable? What if you have only $30,000 and you can buy only some, uh, some hardware, you can buy everything that we need? Can we, can we set up the system in such a way that, depending on how much money you have, that's a, that will be the quality, but you still can run the system? And you might have a lower, uh, uh, let's say, bandwidth, so again, we have to incorporate that into our system. And we came up with several approaches, and uh, I can show you some of the solutions. So the physical space that we built was pretty much, uh, there is a large LCD display, there is a bunch of cameras that would do the 3D reconstruction. We put the cameras on tripods, we have some mounted uh, displays and we have some portable uh, displays. And then there is a machine which is dedicated to each uh, cluster of cameras to do the 3D reconstruction. And uh, then you have a camera that does the synchronization of all the equipment that you have in the room. There is a uh, computer dedicated to just rendering because remember that I am uh, getting all the incoming stream from you to my lab and fusing that information with all the 3D information that I cre create in my lab 
and I'm placing that into the virtual space. So the renderer has to do all the fusion. The incoming and outgoing streams are handled by the gateway, which more or less connects to your machine and says, hey, I'm ready. Let's get together and let's uh, run a session. So you can see there is uh, lots of hardware. And uh, we worked uh, originally with, uh, uh, with the dancers because they were interested in coming up with a choreography and dancing together in virtual space. The same way as my dream is to play basketball with Michael Jordan, they wanted to dance together to some, uh, some musical music. So you can see this was the physical space uh, at, uh, at, at our campus. You have the LCD displays, the cameras, and that's the virtual space, which actually was the same at uh, Berkeley at our campus. And these were, these were two different people from different geographical sites. And here is a movie that uh, we kind of recorded what you saw in that virtual space. There are two dancers. One is at Berkeley, 2,000 miles away from us. One is at, uh, uh, on our campus in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, they are sitting on a bench. The way how we kind of uh, synchronize everything is that we said, OK, let's put the physical bench in both labs. And then the, the dancers were sitting on that bench. And they can hug each other. They can dance. You can see that the motion is very slow when we started this project. We had the frame rate, I think, around uh, five frames per second. So they had to understand they cannot go too fast. And um, what you see in the middle, by the way, this piece, this is just a pointer that's an artifact. Uh, we usually keep that a little tiger that, that shows us uh, uh, the zero, zero, zero. Uh, but it's not uh, uh, reconstructed. So this is roughly the quality uh, of the reconstruction that we got. But you can see that these uh, dancers were, were quite excited that it allows them to do new things and um, it's a very creative, at least from their perspective. So how does the system work? And again, I think it's getting really late today, so I'm not going to tell you exactly all the details. <laughs> but simply think of it like there are multiple machines talking to each other. There are camera machines doing lots of computation. The renderer is doing the fusion. The gateway is commuting, communicating over the internet, lots of communication. And I think you can easily imagine how complicated things become. So what are the challenges? Let me just list a few of them. So let's suppose I sell you a system for $50,000. I cannot ask you to understand all the computer vision problems and everything. It has to be uh, working like this. So there has to be automation of the whole calibration. Uh, uh, remember, we had uh, uh, students working at Berkeley, uh, the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, at NCSA. They all contributed to the same software stack. So how do you coordinate this large team of developers so uh, the system doesn't break? How do you deal with real-time requirements, right? As soon as I start to play basketball, the ball is bouncing fast. I need a high frame rate. People had different hardware. Uh, how do I incorporate that? Networking issues, the latency. We had no control over the connection between uh, uh, Urbana-Champaign and uh, Berkeley. Right? So it has multiple hops, what are the network delays, and so forth. Synchronization, rendering, robustness, all those issues. So what we have uh, worked first on was the original calibration took about 15 to 20 hours. You can see on the right uh, side, that's the calibration result after 20 hours, where you see those four blue uh, uh, kind of clusters of points, and those, the, uh, those show where exactly the cameras are located so it can reconstruct accurately. We introduce a new technique that now it takes only one, two, three hours, and we have a new solution that's going to take even less uh, so um, we can do it uh, pretty much on the fly. The second piece was, as I explained to you, my, uh, my shadow is right there, and my kind of... Uh, uh, introduce artifacts like my student here. He stands here, and you can see the shadows that would be reconstructed. Sometimes the reconstruction would be very poor because of the illumination changes. What we introduce is a thermal infrared camera. We can improve much more the background foreground detection, and now we can uh, have much more robust system, and I don't have to worry about your background. For example, if I had a dark uh, uh, coat, like I have a blue navy, navy blue jacket, if I would stand against a, a blue, a blue wall, my jacket would not be reconstructed. Now, on the other side, it's really exciting to go there, and I have a white shirt, and I would be reconstructed. 
I pull up my jacket, or actually, sorry, the other way. If I have a, a white shirt and under that I have a black uh, T-shirt, because the black would be the same as the background, it would not be reconstructed. So as I pull up my shirt, suddenly there would be a hole, and you can see inside of my belly, which would be nothing. <laughs> Uh, so there are very many interesting experiments that we have done. Um, one of the weaknesses was the, high, uh, the, the frame rate. So you can see that with better machines, now we are using quad-core machines, which means four processors, we can achieve 20 to 24 frames per second. This is our wheelchair basketball coach in Illinois. You might not know that our campus has one of the best uh, wheelchair basketball coaches. So we teamed up with them. We just got an NSF funding for this project to really uh, understand how they can coach across multiple geographic locations. And uh, you can see that there was a, uh, so this is the coach, and this is the rendering, and uh, in the other lab was the lady, and he's teaching her hook pass. So he's showing her how to do hook pass. She's doing that in the physical space in the other lab because we had the webcam on, and this is what you would see um, in that virtual space. So now they can see each other from multiple view angles. What I want to show you here is a movie where I'm sitting in a wheelchair, and I want to show you that now it's really real time because I can bounce the ball, I can throw the ball, uh, the, the motion is not jerky anymore. And uh, uh, so hopefully we are slowly getting there so it can run um, any, any possible application where you need uh, real time requirements. Uh, actually, at some point, I tossed the ball against the basketball hoop and it fell on me. Maybe we'll see even that part. Let me see. You can see that I enjoy slam dunks. Um, <laughs> it's really easy. Uh, the basketball hoop is from my son, so it's the, it's the very short one. Uh, <laughs> um, Uh, now, the neat thing is really that you can, uh, as a coach, if I am moving my hand and you see my front view, you would not know how far away I'm from my face. While if you can change the view angle, you can tell the student, hey, you should be moving closer to your face, right? If, I, if you see only this view, you will, you will not know whether the motion is correct. Oh, that was the time when the basketball fell on me. Uh, can dribble. If I had uh, if I had the audio, you would even hear bouncing and other things. Let's see. Okay. So what is next? Clearly, uh, you can think of many applications where this kind of environment would be useful. One of them is uh, for business purposes. Instead of you traveling to uh, many places, you might just have a teleimmersive space, and then it can save you. Uh, some extra uh, travel cost. For collaboration purposes, uh, the, uh, the dancers are very interested for, uh, to do distributed ballet, opera. I am really thinking that the medical community might be interested uh, in using that for physical therapy, uh, using that for rehabilitation exercises. Uh, there are military applications, clearly, for decision-making purposes. Um, there is also a niche, I believe, in advertisement uh, because we have done some work uh, with that community. And you would be very surprised, but people who really came to us and said, we want to use your system were people like uh, social scientists because they believe that if we all get together and we start to interact, they want to know, let's suppose we discuss budget. Some people are more aggressive, some people are less aggressive. They want to know who is who and whether they blush. So if we have a thermal infrared camera, I can even see who is getting reddish because uh, they are too aggressive. Or... So it's really an, uh, it's all about unobtrusive monitoring of people that what the social scientists would like to do. And then for education purposes, there is no question about it that that would be beneficial. What we are building right now is something like, you come to me and say, I have $40,000, I can buy 10 clusters, and I have activity of type A, where I really need high resolution because I'm looking at faces and I want to do face recognition, as opposed to playing basketball where I don't really care about the face. I can tell you where to place the cameras, at which height, uh, how many you need at least, uh, what will be the space where you can move, and so forth, so some kind of simulation environment. Uh, 
The other thing that we are looking at right now is what should be the set of virtual objects? Like when you play basketball, you cannot have physical ball because we are all gonna be passing the ball to each other. And at some point, we have to figure out when the ball is uh, intercepting your, your hand, you have to ha you have the feedback. How would you do that? Well, should I use my, uh, my cell phone and the same way as it vibrates, suddenly the same sensor is gonna say, hey, you have the ball or you are bumping to the other uh, player and therefore you should go around. So that feedback and the interaction with virtual objects is still an open problem for us. And the final thing is uh, just do a very simple calculation. If you have 640 by 480, that's the pixel size of those images, times let's say five bytes per pixel, although sometimes we have more, even if you use 15 frames per second, uh, then you are really talking, and you, this is just one cluster, right? If you have about 10 of these clusters of cameras, you are talking about 230 megabytes per second. And that is gonna lead you to probably compression algorithms. So we have another professor who is looking at some compression via clustering and classification. There are issues with networking and uh, what should be the right protocol. When you lose some packets, should you retrieve them and, uh, or you should you just discard them? So how do you go about that? So in conclusion, I just wanna say that right now I'm here because I thought that this is the right community to talk about uh, really some exciting applications for it and maybe find some collaborations. Um, as I mentioned, social scientists are interested at uh, Berkeley, the Tai Chi uh, students are very interested. They use it for learning and they actually have published a paper where the student who was taught using a 2D video and the student who was taught using the tele immersive space had a very different learning curve because clearly uh, there is a benefit to it. But the medical I put there because I think that it's really the domain where this could find a, a good use. We are also looking at some new hardware. There are some smart cameras. So next time when I deliver that to a, uh, to a, a user, I can just uh, bring just the clusters and there will be embedded processing so I don't have to have a computer associated with that. And there are clearly new sophisticated algorithms that are needed and that's very exciting for Peter, for me. So I'm looking at those. And um, you might laugh now, but as we work with the dancers, they would say, okay, I recorded my session, now I'm replaying that and I can enter that scene and dance with myself. The same way the basketball players can say, okay, now I'm playing and I record that session, now I can play against myself. So very interesting uh, things, uh, uh, people are very creative, so I'm saying creati creativity has no limits. You can really think of applications that we haven't thought of in the teleimmersive space. Finally, I wanna say that there are many people who work on, on this project. It's a large project that involves people from NCSA, computer science department, electrical and computer engineering department, Berkeley uh, and uh, our campus. There are users, domain scientists. These are the Disability Research Institute, uh, uh, the wheelchair basketball players. There are dance students and there are Department of Communication professors. And uh, the funding for our part, because everybody's bringing his or her own uh, funding, just comes from NCSA and our campus and we just got NSF funding. So my final slides just says, if you wanna know more about it, there are some uh, URLs you can visit. If it's interesting to you, please let me know. I welcome any questions, even ph philosophical questions about this uh, real-time cloning. Um, there are uh, many questions. I already heard that uh, somebody wrote an article in the Computer IT magazine that this might be really bad because it will introduce uh, cyber sex. So again, I cannot say anything <laughs> about that. But <laughs> I think we are developing that for, for, uh, for the purpose of collaboration. And then uh, uh, if you find it interesting, please uh, let us know. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, I'm interested in the implications for the audio going with the graphic images. I work at the St. Louis Symphony and uh, we have used Internet 2 for some master classes so that a cellist in Cleveland might be interacting with a student in San Francisco. But 
One of the problems that we keep having is with the quality of the audio. Have you had any experiences on that front? And uh, do you have any guesses as to the implication of the integration of both the graphic and the audio? So let me repeat the question. Uh, uh, the question is uh, whether we have any experience with the audio uh, because uh, uh, the lady said that they have uh, run similar uh, uh, experiments and uh, there was noise, right? You said noise or uh, the quality was very low. Now, I have to honestly say that in our case, we never focus on the audio. For us, the images are uh, our big problem. And uh, the way how we communicate is uh, we just use Google Talk. That's the simplest way how to communicate. The dancers, when they, uh, when they ran that, uh, that session, they would have pre-recorded uh, music. Um, I think uh, we also tried to do the uh, uh, voice over IP connection with Berkeley. Uh, there is a latency, and it would look a little bit funny if one dancer is uh, moving a little bit behind the other dancer because the music is delayed. So uh, for us, just the image, trans or more or less the 3D information being transmitted over a large distance is a big of a problem. We never looked at the audio, but for your uh, artistic, uh, uh, more or less when you have an orchestra and you really want to have a very good artistic uh, performance, then the uh, delay should be, should be eliminated. And um, yeah, I, I cannot uh, say that we have a solution for that. Yes, please. Uh, has there been any research done or looking to integrate this into social virtual reality and things such as Second Life? So the question is whether this kind of environment could be integrated into an environment like the social life you mentioned, or Second Life. Second Life. Uh, we, we haven't done any studies, but I think uh, this will be definitely one of the directions to take the technology because uh, uh, combining the virtual en environment with the with the physical space, it's the way to go, even for gaming industry. Well, thank you very much. Okay.